Welcome to all our friends and colleagues, and thank you for joining us for our Curry Lecture Series. I'm Lindy Crew, Curry's Director, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Frederick Whitling. I would also like to extend a special welcome to His Excellency, Mr. Martin Hoekstrom, Ambassador of Sweden in Cyprus, who joins us at Curry tonight for this lecture held in collaboration with the Embassy of Sweden in Nicosia. As all archaeologists working in all periods of Cypriot archaeology will be aware, we are approaching the 100 year anniversary of the beginning of the work of the Swedish Cyprus expedition. And this year marks 100 years since the individual who was to be leader of the expedition, Anna Gestad, first began his pioneering work. There will doubtless be extensive celebrations in 2027, and Kari is very glad to be involved with commemorating the excellent work undertaken by the SCE, which resulted in the reports that many of us continue to use for our research all this time after they were first published. Now to introduce Dr. Whitney. Frederick received his PhD in History and Civilization at the European University Institute in Florence in 2010, with a dissertation entitled The Western Way, Academic Diplomacy, Foreign Academies and the Swedish Institute in Rome, 1935 to 1953. Since this time, he has been a fellow and lecturer at a number of research institutes, including in Berlin, Athens, Sweden, Geneva and Istanbul, and serving as the assistant director at the Swedish School in Athens. He has also served as a longtime board member of the Swedish schools in both Athens and Rome. Frederick's research interests include the histories of foreign schools, the Swedish king, Gustav VI, and classical and Roman reception, and he has published extensively in English and Swedish, including three monographs and further edited volumes and over 40 academic papers. He has disseminated his research widely, presenting numerous lectures and conference papers, as well as organizing workshops. We are delighted to host Frederick at Kari as the 2023 Kari Scholar in Residence. I would now like to invite Dr. Whitling to present his lecture this evening entitled Swedish Space in Terra Incognita, Crown Prince Gustav Adolf's 1930 Cyprus Sojourn and the Division of Fines of the Swedish Cyprus Expedition. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Is this on now? Let's see. Uh, yeah, well, this well, I will be speaking for a few minutes. But, um, if it's not on, I'll just have to raise my voice or uh, use the. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be. This is. I'm afraid out of my control. Um, <clears throat> no? Yes? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you to uh, Kari. It's a great joy and pleasure to uh, to be here, obviously, but also to be the, uh, the scholar in residence at this very fascinating and stimulating institution. And... Uh, Thank uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador, for being here this evening, and uh, other all other friends and uh, and uh, visitors, as it were, also online. So, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. <laughs> Swedish spades, terra incognita. I'll uh, I'll get back to these uh, these concepts. They are both quotes, which is indicative of my research and indicative of what I will be talking about in this lecture. This year, twenty twenty three. Possibly even this month marks the 100th anniversary of the first time that the Swedish archaeologist Einar Jastard set foot on Cyprus. He crisscrossed much of the island on a bicycle and excavated at four sites during the autumn and winter of 1923 to 24, providing the material for his doctoral dissertation and sowing the seeds for the Swedish Cyprus expedition, which started, as we all know, in 1927. This talk will discuss ongoing work for a coming book project on the expedition based on primary archival research, placing the expedition in a socio-political context. I preliminarily called it the Swedish Cyprus Expedition Revisited. I hope to come up with a better title than that eventually. Uh, 
The island as a whole is a sort of premise for this. Uh, the map here is from, uh, uh, it's an idyllic map from 1933, let's say. Peaceful representation of Cyprus with uh, cute figures indicating the various places. You see this figure, this sculpture going fishing at Kition, for example, uh, indicating the places that were excavated by, as you all know, by the Swedish Cyprus expedition. Uh, the talk will, as I say, focus on hitherto uh, unpublished archival material on the expedition, and not least, I will. The talk will be leading up to to the sojourn, the visit of Crown Prince Gustav Adolf of Sweden to Cyprus in 1930. Why did he come? He visited Cyprus in connection with the division of the fines of the Swedish expedition, and also briefly took part in uh, its excavations. His presence during the uh, division of the fines certainly had an impact on the negotiations, which resulted in the allocation of more than half of the individual fines to Sweden. Uh, as I'm unfortunately unable to show some unpublished photographs, at the moment, I hope to be able to do this in the future uh, from this visit. I have instead included a few contemporary images, for example, from an article in the National Geographic magazine from 1928. An, an uh, article entitled Unspoiled Cyprus, some of them in color, autochrome, which must be rather a novelty at the time. Images such as this, to give you a, a little, to take us back to 1928, to Cyprus as it might have been, at least in this rather romanticized view. But also images such as this, which are definitely of its time. More of these wonderful color images from 1928 in, in itself, it's worth, uh, it's worth showing. And perhaps not least, this image of Lidra Street in Nicosia. Um, in a way, everything, especially Cyprus perhaps, has always been better before. This is a sort of general historical trope. Nostal nostalgia is strong in the relatively recent past, regardless of when. I think we're all perhaps, I certainly am, uh, responsible for a bit of that myself. But there's been a, there's always looking back to, uh, as it were, other and sometimes perhaps better times. This piece in the National Geographic was published when the British government was able to uh, celebrate, as it were, 50 years of British control of the island. This 1928 coin uh, is indicative of that. Hmm. Uh, I take the liberty of showing the cover of this book, which I have just published, uh, which is uh, a, uh, an overview, let's say, of uh, the manifold activities of the former king of Sweden uh, in his role as archaeologist and, uh, and as chairman of the various archaeological um, sort of, uh, committees. Uh, I will return to that in a moment. There are some images that I cannot show you tonight, but they're in the book, and I will get back to them. Um, this is uh, the sort of basis for what I'm about to be talking about here. So I'm from, from this wider study on the king, I'm now zooming in, let's say, on Cyprus, and specifically in 1930. Um, there are so many as aspects of this theme of this topic that I won't have time to, to uh, go into tonight, but um, I'm hoping this book might be translated in one published letters in, in the book, including photographs. Uh, the well-known book, Ages and Days, in English translation, Sekler uh, Vodaga in Swedish, was written by Aina Jastad and uh, published in 1933 as an account, a popular account of the Swedish Cyprus expedition and re reaching out to a, a general readership, a general audience, let's say, in Swedish, essentially a collection of published newspaper articles uh, relating, for example, the genesis and the development of this extremely ambitious archaeological undertaking. You see here the, the copy which exists in the library here uh, with this, uh, as you can see, the dedication to uh, John de Patea from the author. <clears throat> uh, Ages and Days was translated surprisingly late, one might uh, argue, given the English-speaking context and British Cyprus and all that. Uh, as I say, these original texts were intended exclusively for a Swedish readership. And there are lots of fascinating, in the Swedish original, lots of interesting geographical comparisons with Sweden, which are perhaps not known to uh, to most of you, but uh, he's, he happily compares uh, 
Cyprus to the island of Gotland in Sweden, for example. And he refers to the three major cities in Sweden when he speaks of the towns in Karpasia. And so this is a, a, a wonderful way of placing Cyprus in a, in a Swedish context, let's say. Uh, there might even be a new translation at some point, who knows, uh, that captures some of these uh, aspects. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity of mentioning Birgitta Lindros Vol's forthcoming publication or book of her father's photographs. Wonderful, uh, wonderful stuff, which will be, when it comes out, the visual accompaniment, essentially, to Yastod's uh, popular account. So what he does then, of course, uh, in this book and also elsewhere, is to relate the genesis of this expedition. You probably, most of you have heard this story before, but I'll, I'll go for it very quickly. Uh, because it's simply worth telling at any at any opportunity. Uh, in a chance meeting at a train station in Serbia in 1922 with a Swedish archaeologist, Axel V. Persson, who was co-leader of the Asine excavations in Greece, Lukis Pieridis, Swedish consul in Larnaca, with great archaeological interest and a private collection of antiquities, borrowed a small sum of money from Axel Persson, uh, seemingly for a transit visa uh, through Bulgaria, his money had been taken in customs, and in conversation brought up archaeological opportunities on the island of Cyprus. Um, and then he borrowed another five pounds, and uh, the rest is history, essentially. <laughs> but uh, Pierre is subsequently invited, as a result of this meeting, the promising young archaeologist, Aina Yastod, who had taken part at Asini in the excavations the year before, to investigate potential excavation sites on Cyprus. This story, which is likely true, was later retold by Yastod several times in writing and in a radio interview in 1942, uh, as well as by others. And he says in this radio interview, he asserts that, quote, if Pieridis had not needed 10 pounds in Serbia, the Cyprus expedition would never have come to pass. If he says it, we'll just have to believe it. Gustav Adolf, the Crown Prince of Sweden, simultaneously received a gift, two crates of uh, quote, a significant collection of Cypriot vases, unquote, from Pieridis's private collection. Lucas Pieridis returned the 10 pounds that he borrowed from Passon, along with a letter urging him to send a young archaeologist from Sweden um, to arrange, quote, for the Swedes to place themselves in archaeological possession of Cyprus. Quite a good quote. It's in the, it's in the Swedish original. It's translated differently in the English, uh, English translation. Um, so this accidental meeting and the loan of ten pounds soon resulted in this in this invitation, as I say. Uh, and these crates of antiquities would be very interesting to know more about. The first one was three hundred and fifty kilos. The next one was seven hundred kilos, filled with quote Cypriot antiquities addressed as a gift from Pierre Edis to the Crown Prince of Sweden, not to anyone else, but to the Crown Prince. Sorry. Come on. The consular system, it, it might be worth uh, mentioning in Cyprus, was mainly connected to trade and uh, all diplomatic relations with Cyprus on embassy level have been established after 1960 for obvious reasons, perhaps. Uh, and archival correspondence, let's say new findings, indicate that Pieridis met with Crown Prince Gustav Adolf in Stockholm in August 1924, which hasn't been mentioned in other contexts. In other words, when Yastod had just been uh, excavating on his bike in Cyprus. And presumably, Pieridis' shipments of antiquities helped in setting up this meeting with the Crown Prince. Uh, <clears throat> Pieridis enthusi enthusiastically informed Gustav Adolf <clears throat> about uh, Yastod's investigations and promised to send even more archaeological objects, as well as possibly donating some material to the National Museum in Stockholm. Was he perhaps hoping for a Swedish decoration, one might ask. He was doing his best. Uh, Eina Jerstad, who you, whom you see there uh, in this photograph, had taken part in the first year, as I mentioned, of the Swedish excavations at Asini in 1922, together with Crown Prince Gustav Adolf, who was there for weeks excavating. Uh, Asini is important. Uh, one applied its, its special mix of Nordic and classical archeo archaeological methods, stratigraphic excavation, influenced by the Swedish Oscar Montelius's early, middle, and late chronology. Uh, Axel Persson was one of the uh, leaders of the excavation, and um, he had discussed um, Pianidis's invitation with Yastod 
on a summer's night there, quote, the kind of night when anything seems possible, unquote, as Yastod put it later, and encouraged Yastod to, uh, to take up this invitation to go to Cyprus. And Yastod, of course, agreed. Although, as he confessed himself, he really did not know, quote, anything about Cyprus at the time. The unknown beckoned. Yastad had recently been in Constantinople, in Istanbul, as one of the few guests of the short-lived Swedish Institute or research home there, um, and as mentioned, went to Cyprus uh, in 1923. He, however, became seriously ill, almost fatally ill, actually, after having contracted malaria while waiting for an appendix operation here in Nicosia. He recovered, however, and otherwise, obviously, things would have been different, not just for him, and also made a study trip to Egypt, Palestine, and uh, Syria. Uh, yes, uh, Pieridis had uh, arranged for Yastor to study, uh, quote, an enormous material from the Bronze Age, unquote, that had been excavated prior to Yastor's arrival by, by Menelaus Marquidis, the first curator of the Cyprus Museum who had, as you probably know, fallen ill with Parkinson's disease and was therefore unable to study the material himself. He also indicated the sites uh, reasonably where Yastod excavated in 1923-24. Uh, one of these was at Alhambra, just south of uh, Nicosia. The results were published two years later in Yastod's doctoral dissertation, Studies on Prehistoric Cyprus, in 1926. This happens to be uh, Claude Schiffer's copy, looks like this. Um, he didn't, as it were, hang about. He also published some uh, <clears throat> topographical notes, as he called them, published in English in 1924 in Kipiria Chronica, an interesting publication that was founded by who? Pieridis, the year before, 100 years ago this year, 1923. A new publication, Yastod publi publishes immediately in English, and then he publishes his, um, his uh, doctoral dis dissertation. So after all of this, the stage was set, and uh, the Swedish Cyprus expedition was preceded by the Cyprus Committee, as it was called, created in Sweden, in Stockholm, in April of 1927. Only two months after a new law in Cyprus, a law that enabled a share of fines to the excavators. This had not been possible before. Crown Prince Gustav Adolf was its chairman. This is there's nothing to do with the Cyprus Committee, but it's from the from the same period, and it, it illustrates this very wide range of simultaneous activities. Here you see, he was the chairman of the so-called Swedish Orient Society. He was the chairman of the so-called China Committee, which you see here in the same period. He was also chairman of the Swedish Institute in Rome, which was founded in 1925. And here you see him visiting the Institute in Rome in February 1927, exactly when this law in Cyprus was being enforced, as it were, when it came into uh, to force. Um, so he was in the middle of all of these uh, various organizations. And this new Cyprus committee was essential in uh, setting up and funding the coming Cyprus expedition. And several of the board members were also part of various other committees, including the Assini Committee. Um, <clears throat> the radio recording that I mentioned, that I was about to play, but it was a bit difficult to do so, uh, was made in 1942. And it was made during a so-called microphone visit by a reporter to an exhibition in Stockholm entitled Ferga Fidias, Before Fidias. Uh, which was organized in 1941. It's quite a time to set up an exhibition. You know, the, the, the war is definitely, as it were, raging. Uh, and this, this radio interview is, is a gold mine. It's full of uh, very lovely quotes, including the Swedish spades that became uh, part of the title of this talk. Um, this is a, a little publication, the catalog that was published by Alfred Veston, one of the members of the expedition, who was curating the Cypress collections, which I'll return to. But the exhibition also included this map and family tree of Swedish excavations on classical soil, classical ground, as they call it. And you can see quite clearly, not, not these from this table, the, the amount, the space that Cyprus takes in, in all of this. If you compare Cyprus to excavations in Greece, Italy, Asia Minor, Egypt, etc., Cyprus, in other words, was a big deal in uh, 1942. And interestingly, it's been hidden in plain sight all these years. The, the root, you can't see it here, but the root of this tree 
refers to the, the Royal, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince's visit to Greece in 1920, which I will ret return to. Well, essentially, this visit to Greece in 1920 set up the Asini Committee and the Asini excavations. And without the Asini excavations, there would have been no Cyprus expedition, etc. So it, it's quite a good, cute sort of illustration of how everything is really connected and has a common uh, root. Uh, let's say Cyprus dominates. And in this interview, there is a reference to Swedish spades, which have uh, shed light on the important um, uh, memories of the various cultures in Greece, Asia Minor, and on Cyprus, which is part of this quote in the, in the interview. And it refers specifically to art collections that have reached Sweden. One of these art collections was, of course, the Cyprus collection, which I will return to eventually. Um, here you see the governor, Sir Ronald Stores at the time. Um, so again, returning slightly to the role of uh, Lucas Pieridis, he had arranged or helped to arrange uh, an approval in principle from the governor of Cyprus, who had, uh, quote, shown great interest in the plans, according to Yastod. And uh, there, Yastod, in his account, refers to the local committee members the museum committee for the for Cyprus Museum. Uh, foremost, quote, of course, our friend Pieridis had been very active, quite active on our behalf. Pieridis was also a member of the Legislative Council and had successfully urged the introduction of this new law that I referred to. He wrote two, probably him, wrote two anonymous articles in his own new, newspaper, Isotis, in 1926. The law came into force, as I said, in February 1927. And this authorized the Cyprus Museum to, again, yes, Todd, cede part of the fines to the expedition. This legal change then was very well timed and it was crucial in uh, attracting the support of the private funders and therefore enabling the Swedish enterprise at all. The fines of the expedition were then expected to be divided between Cyprus, in other words, indirectly Britain, and Sweden after the end of the excavations. This law was interestingly changed again in 1935. So no more share of any fines. So there was in essence less than a 10 year legal gap for, for this to be able to happen between 1927 and 1935. Uh, the expedition profited to say the least from this. Uh, one of the advocates for this Cyprus project was a, a professor of art history in, at Lund University in Sweden, Ebert Wrangel who had been involved in various enterprises, including this institute in Constantinople. Uh, and he corresponded uh, with the Crown Prince about this Cyprus undertaking. Um, interestingly, though, the Crown Prince Gustav Adolf found the suggestion of the Cyprus ex project interesting, quote, if not to say appealing, and he was referring specifically to its prehistoric possibilities. Wonderful to finally be able to excavate Bronze Age Cyprus, etc. Uh, however, he expressed, quote, strong doubts to his own support and his own participation in, in, in any direct way. And he did so for two reasons. His other parallel archaeological engagements, which I've been, which I just showed a few of, Asina, China, etc. But more importantly, he was very skeptical as to the scale of this Cyprus undertaking, and perhaps rightly so. And not least the cost. It was going to be extremely expensive. And there essentially was no state funding. All the, all the money came from uh, private uh, donors, and he was a key figure in attracting these private uh, donors. Uh, it will be too, too expensive and too wide ranging, and uh, one can't really envisage its scope uh, in scientific or financial terms, he writes. And he explains this in, this in various letters. But he was essentially convinced. So, this is the map from the first uh, SCE publication in 1934 of the various excavation sites. Um, as we know, very briefly then, the, the whole expedition project set out to systematically document the early history of Cyprus in its entirety from the very beginning and to establish a first far top, top to bottom chronology in Cypriot archaeology. It was led by Anna, Anna Yastod, together with his young colleagues, Erik Fröckvist and Alfred Weston, together with the architect and photographer Jon Lindros. None of them had reached the age of 30 when the expedition began. Very young men, in other words. 
And during three and a half years, this small Swedish group carried out archaeological excavations all over Cyprus, as you can see, at more than 20 individual archaeological sites. For example, at Lapitos, Idalion, Marion, Buni, Soli, Ayairini, Mitovikla, Enkomi, Amatus, Kition, etc. This is all familiar to many of you. Um, I will give you just uh, out of all the many photographs available, let's say I have chosen only a few. This very famous, one of the, if not the only picture, where all, the four of them are actually together uh, from the beach at Mersinaki. A Quirkfist excavating a tomb, another tomb from Amatus. Various, an indication of the nature of these wonderful photographs. Anything from the group photographs with the, with all the workers hanging out with the priest, uh, leaving Lapitos in the, in the car and uh, standing in Idalion smoking a cigarette and, uh, and excavating. Uh, photographs from Ayairini, the famous site, which I have no time to really go into at all at the moment, but uh, emblematic, of course, of the whole project <clears throat> with its fantastic, um, unique finds. Um, you see sculptures from in situ at Kition, and you see Jon Lindus at work. Um, <clears throat> yes, so this the time frame. I will turn to this in a moment. You might just read the text. The time frame of the, these exploits in Cyprus is staggering by both modern and contemporary standards at the time. So from Yastod's first visit to the island exactly 100 years ago in 1923 to carrying out excavations the following year and publishing his PhD, resulting in this large-scale archaeological program as a result, it's, it's quite, quite something. Um, and his original con concept was to follow on these initial excavations that he had already carried out. In other words, focusing on prehistory, particularly on the Bronze Age. But the aim soon expanded to this ambitious scope, to say the least, of studying, quote, the entire cultural history of Cyprus from the Stone Age to the Roman Age, unquote. Why not, while you're at it? You know, we published this summary in 1930 uh, of the, uh, this is the Kari copy of this summary of uh, the Swedish excavations. And uh, of course, the Crown Prince of Sweden is figures uh, very prominently in, in any uh, description of, of the project uh, from the, of this time. Um, he used a similar, yes, to comparative perspective to that of investigating settlements in order to place the material that had been excavated by Menelaus Marquidis in context. And he set out to undertake a thorough scientific evaluation of what he called a series of excavations of dwellings, temples, and tombs in order to achieve a representative collection of monuments and finds in different localities so that we could study the cultural differences caused by local conditions. This is what it was. It obviously could not be a one-man show. And uh, as Yerstow put it, the whole project was moving, ambulating. Its excavation site was the entire island of Cyprus, unquote. So you know, this Cyprus is the excavation site. Um, Yerstow had secured the loan famously of one of the 500 first Volvo cars from the production belt uh, of the new company, which was founded in 1927. Here you see it in the Gladstone Road on the, in, the, in a muddy day in the Nicosia. Uh, <clears throat> you also see the four members all dressed up uh, at the other house. Uh, slightly like laconically, amusingly, they called the car simply in the singular, Volvo. It was never the Volvo, it was just Volvo. Uh, the four Swedes traveled around doing their thing and were well seen overall and also quite importantly spoke a little Greek. And they had learned this little Greek at Asini, partly along with the ex excavation pra practice and techniques. So both Yastod, Fuerkvist and Vestholm had all been to Asini and, and learned excavation uh, techniques. Um, the expedition is often portrayed in retrospect as a success story, let's say, as everything was clear from the very beginning, following a scientific plan, plan with clear aims. In reality, in practice, as in many, if not most, research projects, as we most of us know, they were, to a large extent, improvising, adapting, and as it were, making it up as they went along, relying on this royal support mechanism, let's say, in terms of attracting funding, and I'll make this clear, hopefully, quite soon. 
and also hoping for the best for the outcome as well as the division of fines. The division of fines was very unclear. The, the, only, the only thing that the law stated was not 50%. It just said that there will be a division of the fines. That's about it. And so it all, the excavations went on and one simply hoped for the best at the, at the end of the day. And they really got more than they bargained for in that sense. So I'll, I'll get back to that as well. For example, and here, here you see Yastard as well in um, Gladstone Street. With a royal suitcase, a suitcase addressed to in French to the, the Crown Prince of Sweden, Stockholm. Probably with some of the some of the letters, some of the hundreds of letters that were sent, and maybe other things. Um, the palace at Bouni, together with Ayarini, is one of the obviously one of the most spectacular uh, individual sites and finds, uh, as it were, of the project. Gerstad apologized for this. This was not supposed to happen. Uh, more ex expressly apologized, more or less, in a, in a letter to the Crown Prince. Really sorry about this. We found this palace. This was not part of the budget. We are aware of this. So uh, <laughs> um, it broke the budget. And Yerstod later praised the Crown Prince for raising the additional funds. It was, quote, only thanks to the intervention of the Crown Prince that this excavation was made possible. And here you see a telegram sent by the Crown Prince. That uh, okay, fair enough. We you can have another twenty thousand Swedish crowns, which was quite a lot of money at the time, for to excavate the palace at Bouni. And here you see Alfred Beston doing exactly that. Uh, at the same time, about one year into the project in 1928, Einar Yerstod gave an outline of uh, continued plans and ambitions in a letter to the chairman, the Crown Prince. Uh, if we can do this, realize the program. The whole cultural history of Cyprus from the Stone Age to the Hellenistic period will be written by the Swedes. I shall, however, need all of next year, 1929. It must be considered an honor for Sweden to now, when the goal is relatively within reach, be able to deal with the whole cultural history of Cyprus. Cyprus, which in sense, the sense of cultural history has been terra incognita in the Mediterranean. So there you get the other part of the, in the title of the, of the lecture. Cyprus, according to Yazdot, was terra incognita. Uh, there are numerous and lengthy handwritten reports to the Crown Prince, which also, his reports were also aimed at the continued funding and, um, of the excavation and attracting more private donors. Uh, here you see uh, another published image from Wuni, but you also see Alfred Beston uh, quite a lot later, together with Knut Tibe, who was a diplomat, chargé d'affaires in Cairo at the time, quite an important figure during the Second World War. Uh, returning to Bouni in the 1930s. <clears throat> so, <laughs> diving even further back into history here, then focusing on this royal figure, Crown Prince Gustav Adolf, who you see here excavating together with uh, Oscar Monterius back in 1905 in Sweden, and a caricature of him doing his thing in Egypt together with uh, that particular little crown, which is specifically the heir to the throne uh, crown, etc. Um, he had visited Cyprus as early as 1905, on his way from Egypt, where he'd recently met his bride-to-be, Princess Margaret of Connaught, and I mention this because, partly because she was British, and I'll return to this. Uh, it's also possible that he passed Cyprus in the autumn of 1924, when he was on his way back to Egypt. To him, Cyprus was part, and I'm convinced of this, of a British-controlled colonial geography, along with Malta, where he'd just been Egypt um, and Cyprus. And uh, in 1926-27, he, for example, visited India, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, etc. He was moving in a British world. Cyprus was part of this British world, and this is not unimportant in, in how this uh, Cyprus expedition was, uh, was set up, I would argue. Uh, this is a list of uh, his various archaeological undertakings, which are quite a few. The ones in bold type are the ones outside Sweden, and you have the Cyprus expedition right bang in the middle of, of this long list, which continued through, throughout his rather long life. And you also see him here in a later image, together with Eric Furtfist, but in the 1950s, in uh, excavations at Morgantina in Italy. And if you visit Merdenhof's Museet, the museum in Stockholm, you will, in the cafe, be met with this by this portrait of, uh, of the former king. So Cyprus was familiar to him, let's say. <clears throat> this is uh, setting the scene. 
And as I said, the question of uh, the eventual division of fines from the expedi Cyprus expedition had not been resolved when the expedition began. And uh, well, it's actually, whether fines might leave the island at all remained unclear to members of the committee in Sweden as late as 1928. Uh, the division of fines was discussed by Einar Jastod in a letter to the Crown Prince in 1928, and he apologized for suggesting a tremendous sacrifice on behalf of his royal chairman. Uh, but would you mind coming to Cyprus, <laughs> basically? And uh, he assured him that, quote, it's however only a burning wish to make the most of the Cyprus expedition that has dictated my words. The law states that the excavators have the right to receive a part of the fines, nothing else. Everything thus depends on a benevolent interpretation of the law. The mere presence of your Royal Highness down here, down here, would outright in itself lead the development in the right direction. In other words, to be advantage in the advantage of Sweden. Uh, Gustav Adolf wrote back to you, I started saying, all right, yeah, it might be, I might visit the island next year then, in 1929. Is this a good time of year to visit in October, which it arguably is? Uh, this didn't happen, but it said it did happen two years later in 1930. Uh, interestingly though, in the, in the meantime, in 1929, Gustav Adolf wrote to Einar Jastod about two meetings with Governor Stores in London, uh, again highlighting this behind the scenes and the regularity of uh, his visits to the British capital, where he made frequent use of the Swedish legation, the embassy in, uh, in London for, for various purposes. <clears throat> Stores was uh, extremely interested and filled with the friendliest atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it was through the Swedish legation in London that, for example, Axel Persson, who was behind the whole thing, was informed that Gustav Adolf would indeed be traveling to Cyprus in October 1930. So London is key here, meeting, meeting the governor, discussing Cyprus outside of Cyprus, let's say, and, and the, the, the right time for the visit. So, uh, Sighs of relief all round. The crown prince was was indeed going to turn up. This would avoid a lot of trouble, quote. And um, there was also, one should note, a general disappointment because the law in Greece had definitely changed in the meantime during the 1920s. And the initial hopes of receiving a lot of the Asini fines to Sweden had been thwarted entirely, which is perhaps a good thing. But then it's, <laughs> this, this is part of the background here. One of the hopes were now for Cyprus in order to, to finally receive a large collection of antiquities to, to Sweden. Um, in anticipa anticipation of his visit to Cyprus, Gustav Adolf was nominated honorary member of the Cyprus Museum Committee in April, 1930. He was nominated by Ronald Storrs just after this, this meeting in London. Um, Storrs was president of the Museum Committee. His private secretary, Rupert Gunnis, who I'll, I'll return to, later inspector of antiquities, was also on the committee. Um, so, he, Gustav Adolf was planning this, what he called strictly private visit to Cyprus, uh, but he also, he didn't just come to uh, divide fines, he also came to dig. And he wrote to, to Jastad, quote, I do know that the excavations will by rights have been finished by then, but I was, however, thinking that some smaller part might be saved. For example, a tomb, or some corner of a large excavation area, or some smaller special excavation, or similar. Would this be possible? I shall have some time to spare. So he couldn't. He couldn't very well say no. So, so yes, a tomb was indeed spared for for the crown prince. For his, this was part of this, the archaeological uh, interest which uh, transcended more than any polite um, such interest. Let's say. So, here we have this British-oriented, oriented Swedish crown prince who, through his marriages had strong links with the, the British royal family, who was married twice into the British royal family, uh, who gave him a very special status in the British colony, let's say, almost as their royal, let's say. But he traveled to Cyprus and to Egypt without his wife. And um, <clears throat> he did so via Egypt, as I mentioned. Just very briefly, in 1929, which is, uh, it's of some relevance here, he was given the, the DIE, the German Archaeological Institute, so-called Winkelmann Medal, which was handed out for the first time ever, the centenary of the German Archaeological Institute. So it, it was given to the Crown Prince of Sweden, which says something about his archaeological undertakings, let's say. He had to share it with the city of Rome. Uh, <laughs> 
but uh, this somehow said it, it speaks volumes i would say about his uh, his personal um, influence and uh, what had to be negotiated by people like Storm once he actually turned up. I would also like to mention that Yastor, just before the Crown Prince turned up in Cyprus, had gone off to Turkey, to Kilikia, to, in 1930, an integral part of the Cyprus expedition work, as he put it, to uh, study comparative pottery and other material. He published his results. Um, and at the same time, interestingly, I might just mention as a little side note, Yastor benefited from the benevolence of the Swedish legation in Constantinople, in Istanbul, and made use of it as a story for free crates of pottery that he sent from Kilikia by, by a train as he went back to Cyprus. These things apparently could be done. Uh, you have an image here of the Crown Prince traveling with Howard Carter, no less, and, and uh, the, the royal assistant, the aide-de-camp, Gunnar Ekerud, and they're on their way, on their way from, uh, from Egypt. Um, the route was to travel from uh, Port Said to Limassol. This is October 1930. Gustav Adolf's arrival in Cyprus was preceded by several newspaper articles, uh, giving Lucas uh, Pieridis credit for sowing the seeds and taking the initiative. Um, and articles that went straight to the political point and really went, they, they, it was perfectly obvious that the division of the fines was about to happen. Um, and uh, it referred to, uh, it, it placed, it, the, the whole thing was placed, his, his visit was placed in a Greek enosis uh, context, let's say, the claims of union with Greece, the motherland, etc. cetera. And, uh, and in, yeah, without, I'll spare you some of the, some of the details. Uh, but it re one article referred to the indisputable rights of the Cyprus Museum and of Sweden to these, these finds of the Cyprus expedition, which will be no doubt recognized by His Royal Highness in the spirit of liberality, et cetera, et cetera. So he was sort of hijacked by the newspapers before he even arrived, saying that uh, we know why you're here and uh, you better do it well, let's say. Um, that was, uh, as it were, the gist of it. And the, the Royal Archives in Stockholm Apart from the photographs of this, this visit to Cyprus, it contains also the wonderful samples of material that uh, he was given uh, during this visit. For example, letters which were handed over to him, presumably when he got off the boat at Limassol, uh, letters that were translated by the British government from Greek with uh, very high strung rhetoric, some of them are just fun. You know, refer referring to the island and Aphrodite, etc. Welcome new Mycenaeus. To the island of the Paphian goddess, thou the most enlightened child of Sweden, all of Cyprus is rejoicing for thy visit, etc., etc. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it also, as does Ages and Days, referred to the, the last chapter there, referred to the golden haired child of the Swedish fjords, uh, which was also quoted in a Swedish newspaper about Gustav Adolf's visit to Cyprus. I can tell you that there are no such Swedish fjords. I think they were mi mixing up Sweden with Norway, possibly. Uh, other letters, there was a professor, teacher, possibly in Larnaca, who welcomed Gustav Adolf, quote, to your country, Cyprus. It is as much ours as, as it is yours. Through the excavations under the patronage of your Royal Highness, you have restored it to us as a part of the Greek lands. Greek it was, Greek it will be, etc., etc. We are very grateful. There was also a letter from the Archbishop, Kirillos, uh, it was translated and uh, again referred ex excavations provided strong proof of the Greek character of the island, etc., etc. So he he ended up he arrived in this uh, sort of beehive of uh, of uh, political um, activity, um, but managed to navigate that quite well, let's say. <clears throat> and a, a final example of that: one of the newspaper articles referred to. Uh, the fact that uh, his name, quote, will be known in Cyprus and will be honored and blessed for centuries to come by generations of, uh, of uh, Cyprus. Uh, they, they might have sort of overdone that a bit. <clears throat> in the event, Gustav Adolf spent 26 days in Cyprus from the 2nd to the 28th of October, 1938. And this royal visit and the route through the island, I, I'm going to trace it very quickly here, and I'll do so through these images that I can't really show you, but I can at least describe the route. And uh, 
thanks to Dr. Rita Severis, a few excerpts from the diary of uh, Rupert Gunnis, which uh, she will be publishing. Um, so I'll combine these sources and, and try to give you an idea of what actually went on during these couple of weeks in uh, mainly Nicosia in 1930. Um, he also received uh, photographs that have been taken before and his own map of Cyprus uh, is preserved with his own handwritten points of interest, etc. Wonderful material, I hope to make something of it at some point. Uh, this is an image of a rather poor quality of, uh, of um, the Crown Prince arriving at Limassol, uh, greeted by Storrs and Rupert Gunnis. Uh, and it also gives a portrait of a first page of the newspaper Isotis um, in advance of his uh, arrival um, to uh, Limassol. There's supposedly also existing film footage of uh, Gustav Otto reaching Limassol, which would be interesting to see. So I now give you a quote from Rupert Gunnis's diary from the 2nd of October. His Excellency the Governor Storrs and I went out to meet the Crown Prince of Sweden, a charming man. I brought the aide-de-camp Ekerut up to Nicosia, presumably Gustav Adolf traveled with the Governor in, in another car. After lunch, took His Royal Highness all round the museum, one and a half hours, exclamation mark. Short, succinct little note of the, of the 2nd of October. The next day, according to Gunnis, His Royal Highness finished the museum and played tennis in the afternoon. Fair enough. The following afternoon, Gunnis took His Royal Highness out to look for fossil shells at Arediu, southwest of Nicosia, on the way to Palihori and Throdos Mountains. Uh, we found masses and he was delighted. He's a most charming person and so simple, insisted on staying until it was dark, unquote. Uh, Gunnis continued with fossil hunting the following day at, quote, the little river in the Limassol Road, don't know which river he's referring to there, and collected more fossil shells with his royal highness, which pleased him very much. Uh, and it, it might be said that uh, the Crown Prince had a very strong geological fossil interest, which went, went back to his childhood. On 6th of October, a dinner was held at the government house. You can't, I can pass this book around by all means. Here you see the placement card of this dinner at Government House. You'll see there's a group photograph that's not been published before, together with Thor's and Rupert Gunnis. I'll leave it out um, for later. Um, and, um, well, of course, so it, might, it must be mentioned, this is a photograph of Government House, which was taken by the Crown Prince only months before the building, as you all know, was burned down in the riots in 1931. So it's, it's interesting also in that... Uh, in that context. So after dinner, no rest for the wicked, etc. Early in the following day, Gustav Adolf traveled in Gunnis's car to the village of Pera, where they kept collecting stuff. We collected stones in the riverbed, and I showed him the monastery and the tombs, presumably the royal tombs of Tamasos, so he doesn't refer to which tombs. Uh, then they went to Arediu, where we spent the rest of the day collecting fossil shells. So after that, and a bit of tennis, on 8th of October, it was time to get down to business. Gunnis noted that he, together with uh, Marquidis, the curator at the Cyprus Museum, the two of them, representing government, as in the British government, started to divide with Yerstadt the finds of the Swedish archaeological expedition. He did about 50 tombs, unquote. This is the first day. So most of the dis division discussion seemingly took place between Marquidis, Gunnis, and Yerstadt, but Gustav Orov was also directly involved on a, let's say, higher level, to, together with the government in, in discussing other aspects and other types of, of finds. The following day, just to continue this little tour, Gunnis showed Gustav Orov around some churches, as he called it, in Nicosia. All of the 10th of October was spent dividing the antiquities, quote, a long and tiring job. This continued the following day. Doesn't, didn't matter that it was a weekend. Quote, divided an antiquities all morning. After lunch, took His Royal Highness around the town. Sunday, they went to Ayarini to collect fossil bones, mostly pygmy hippo hippopotamus, unquote. These were busy people, collecting, collecting fossils and dividing um, antiquities. During these two weeks, Gustav Adolf visited most of the islands, and uh, several photographs in this collection that I, I keep referring to are from Nicosia, but followed also by pictures from, for example, the village of Pera, from Bela Pais, from Kirenia, Ifrea, Idalion, Ayos Varnavas, Ayos Sergios. There's an unnamed Cypriot village, 
which sort of rhymes a little bit with the ethnographic perspective, let's say, of the National Geographic piece. They went to Salamis, they went to Stili, you know, where they would excavate, I'll return to that. They went to Ayerini, Pamagusta. They traveled around the Carpasia Peninsula. Nitovikla was one of the sites they visited. Um, they, in, in other words, they were trying to visit as many of the Swedish sites as they, as they, were, as they could. They went to Enkomi, and they went to Larnaca. And the quote, the caption for this picture, which exists in various versions, there's also a version in the Royal Archive, the caption written by the Crown Prince is consul periods with family and Swedish archaeologists. And so, yeah, which is a good description, I suppose. So you have Jastor standing behind him, you have Eric Brick, who's sitting on the stairs, etc. Um, the visit continued to Hala Sultantake. They went to Kolossi Castle outside Limassol. They went to Kurion and they visited Limassol itself. They went up into Throdos Mountains. They also visited the Pen Pendadactylos Mountains. They went to St. Hilarion Castle. And there are wonderful group images from St. Hilarion with stores his family. They went to Buni. They visited the village of Mandres, north of uh, Ayos Jakobos, um, etc. Yes. Um, and then Ghani's diary notes on the Division of Fines resumed uh, just before the Crown Prince was about to leave. Uh, after church at St. Paul's, His Excellency the Governor and His Royal Highness settled the division of the gold objects from Enkomi and various other points. After lunch, I transferred our share to the museum, as in the Cyprus chair, the British chair, as it were. There was a museum meeting the next day, and I must mention this part, at least, because it's before I do, I'm about to wrap this up. Uh, when uh, the museum committee inspected the result of the division, there was a bit of difficulty, difficulty about a gold necklace, but in the end, everything was settled. After lunch, the Crown Prince gave R Rupert Gunnis a, a heavy silver cigarette case with his monogram, showed His Royal Highness the town and had a final look in the museum. So uh, this, in the Royal Archives, in other archives, there is a, there's a copy of this memorandum regarding the antiquities, the division. Uh, there were various principles followed to not divide tomb finds to keep various groups intact. Uh, there were exceptions though. Uh, antiquities purchased by the Swedes for as subscribers of the expedition were allowed export and uh, et cetera. And pottery fragments would go to Sweden. Skulls, as in skeletal remains, would be sent to Sweden to study, then return to Cyprus, et cetera. All of this was um, was gone through meticulously, signed by Storms, Grisavaro, Piridis, Gunnis, Marquidis, Gerstad, Lindus, Vestron, and Fuerkis, among others. The next day, Gustavaro departed the island, 20th October. After early lunch, Gunnis writes, went down to Limassol and saw the Crown Prince off. He seems to have enjoyed his visit very much indeed. The, vis the division continued, but as I mentioned, he did not only divide fines, he also insisted on digging. And he did so in this tomb at uh, Stili. Um, and in this, there's a, there are two photo, photographs from this excavation. And in Best Tom's catalogue from 1942, you see one of the objects, caption reads, uh, excavated by uh, the Crown Prince. Uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, he, he partook in the project that he had significantly contributed to, let's say. So all of this was praised in, in many ways in uh, the, the times to come, let's say. And uh, looking back on this, both Twerkist and Veston praised uh, the Crown Prince's um, direct involvement in all this, uh, also referring to uh, the good relations with, uh, with uh, the British government. This is in stark contrast, however, to uh, contents of a letter from the Astor to Gustav Adolf, which I will mention in the summer of 1928, which referred, for example, to a secret British excavation at Soli, with the intention of, quote, trying to outdo us at their own game, so to speak, to organize an English expedition. Yerstod found out about this. He related that he had found out about this so-called nuisance, quote, and averted it without mentioning how he did that. In the same letter, he criticized both Gunnis and Stalls, referring to the governor as a vain charlatan, quote. The crown prince replied to him saying, calm down, mate, basically, and uh, the, the the conciliatory stance was uh, was encouraged, but this the, it's useful to say perhaps that all was not necessarily entirely rosy, and uh, exactly how these division negotiations actually went remains to be perhaps discovered. But the result, as you probably all know, was more than half of these, more than twelve thousand of the approximately eighteen thousand fines being allocated to Sweden. 
complete fine groups, etc., keeping a unique object in Cyprus, but the rest get, went to Sweden. Um, in this uh, radio interview that I mentioned, Alfred Verstorm referred to the Cypriot authorities being very liberal in the division of the fines, and also mentioned that in this exhibition in 1942, only about 3% of them were exhibited in this wartime exhibition. So, wrapping up, you, all, you can all recognize this probably as Famagusta Harbor, referred to here in 1928 as the Emporium of the East, which is rather nice. Uh, <clears throat> this image, which is quite well known, is of the 771 cases of antiquities that were sent to Sweden on a, on a ship, uh, which formed the so-called Cyprus collections, Sip and Samiana, which is the largest worldwide collection of Cypriot antiquities outside of the island, and would can constitute the foundation and backbone of Merlos Museet in Stockholm. And uh, the story of their, their life in Stockholm is interesting. There's no time to go into that here. Uh, you see some images here of Eric Perkvist working on the stuff. Uh, you see how the Cyprus collection is exhibited in an historical museum in Stockholm in 1941. And uh, of course, the publication. Um, interestingly, there is no, I have no idea what this contained, but Yastod received a message from Gustav Adolf at Christmas, 1931, thanking him for a Christmas present thanking him for the Cypriot chest that the expedition members had sent to him. One would like to know what it contained. A souvenir from his Cyprus uh, visit with mementos and quote, memory of a very stimulating and interesting trip. A decade later, 42, uh, Yastor and Veston handed over an album of photographs from the activities of the Cyprus expedition to the Crown Prince. So the interest continued. And the publications of course, were became the laser foundations for the modern Archaeology, classical archaeology on Cyprus, a master key, as it's referred to in another document. It, the expedition firmly placed Cyprus on the map from a Swedish perspective. Uh, other excavations in the 1940s. Um, interestingly enough, Gustav Adolf later met with Ronald Storrs in 1948 in London, handing over the, the Swedish, latest Swedish publication and also having a little communication about uh, aspects that are of uh, various political nature from the 1930s. Uh, so, in the early 1970s, Paul Ostrom, previously director of the Swedish Institute in Rome and Athens, rekindled, as we all know, the Swedish archaeological presence on Cyprus with a new Swedish expedition excavating at Halasul Tantakena near Larnaca, and work has continued there after his, his death. The final images here are Ena Yastad Street in Larnaca, not only because of his archaeological endeavors, but also because of his um, help with financial help with various uh, with refugees later in the 1970s. An image from the inauguration of Merdros Museet in Stockholm in its presence pre premises together with the present King of Sweden. But Ena Yastod, which is nice, to, one has to say, lived to see it. He was there for it. He spent basically all of his career working for a decent installation of these Cyprus collections in Stockholm, which arguably came to pass. Um, this is what it looks like, the current Leventis Gallery installation, in the, the portrait in the cafe, etc. And the very final image is perhaps fitting, the, uh, the famous Aeolian finds in both Stockholm and in Nicosia, which together, of course, constitute a unified whole, as perhaps the island of Cyprus might be seen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frederick. That was fascinating. And I'm sure we are going to have many questions. Um, I, yeah, I can't, thank you. Um, so we can stop recording, I guess, if we, and Paula will do that if we haven't already.